You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected volume uh, by Rudolf Steiner, number 181, which uh, it has three cycles in it, three lecture cycles. This is a reading of the second lecture cycle, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy. It is the second of nine lectures, numbered Lecture 9 in this volume, uh, given in Berlin on the 1st of April, 1918. The day before yesterday, when I tried to describe how human beings are influenced and affected by the geographical location where they live and develop. My primary aim was to paint a vivid picture of the whole earth as an organism, an ensouled and spirit-imbued organism. Like an organism, in which each part has its special role, the arms having a different function from the legs and the heart a different function from the brain, so every part of the soul and spirit-filled organism of the earth, likewise, has its distinctive task. We can see the special task of human limbs in their shape. The arms are formed differently from the legs and the heart differently from the brain. This is not so apparent in physical terms in the case of the earth organism. It will not be clear to a materialistically minded geographer that the diverse continents or regions of the earth have different modes of action, different functions. Only when we can consider the earth's soul and spirit, as it were, can we come to see this. To do so, we need to gain a really tangible sense of the earth as an ensouled, spirit-imbued organism and of the physical human being living upon it as a part of this organism. This gives rise in turn to various questions, and anyone who thinks that we only have one life, are born and die once, will not make headway with such questions. Physical human beings can only be incorporated into one particular region of the earth at any one time, and if we lived only once, we would be fated to adapt specifically to the one region where we lived, and never have any prospect of becoming whole we would remain confined to one aspect of the earth organism. Insight into the ensouled, spirit-filled nature of the earth, however, in turn shows something very important, that our real deeper being, which we refer to in saying capital I, cannot be directly but only indirectly connected to this differentiation of humankind in different regions of the globe and that the sole spiritual core of our being in a sense only inhabits what is differentiated in specific ways in diverse regions. We can therefore gradually acquire insight into the fact that the outward appearance of human beings, as we first perceive it, is not identical with their sole spiritual core, and that this outward form is really only a dwelling place formed in accordance with distinctive regional conditions. Those already familiar with spiritual science will not find this in the least surprising. And I mention it only to show that a really thorough consideration of regional conditions across the globe could lead people quite rationally toward what spiritual science teaches. It is a most misleading prejudice to say that spiritual science can only be comprehensible to someone who can grasp spiritual realities. This very erroneous idea that because one cannot perceive clairvoyantly, one is right to see spiritual science as something of no concern to humanity, as an unproven hypothesis, allows people to stay in comfortable ignorance. In fact, really thorough and detailed thinking can comprehend spiritual science. Such thinking must be willing to study actual phenomena 
in the light of what spiritual science states. Someone who takes knowledge available to him about the character and qualities of diverse peoples across the globe and studies this in relation to what spiritual science says about it will soon find that the comments I made last time prove their worth in relation to the phenomena. Realities we encounter must be studied in terms of these insights. We have to be willing to test spiritual scientific knowledge against actual experience in an open-minded and unprejudiced way. And then rational understanding of any field can lead to a recognition of spiritual science. This is something of great importance today. And in fact, far more than one thinks, there are esoteric traditions that possess such knowledge and yet at the same time they often hold fast to a view that was justified until recent times and is still perpetuated, that deeper insights should not be made public. I have often explained the reasons why people who have such knowledge do not wish to share it, but why also these reasons no longer hold good today. But there is a difficulty here. Firstly, one is up against the refusal of most of humanity to countenance spiritual science and then also meets opposition from those who think it wrong to reveal truths discovered by spiritual science in the same way that other truths are revealed. Those who still think that the veil should not be lifted on certain truths can modify their outlook if they acknowledge important things I stated albeit in a somewhat theoretical form, but clearly enough, as it seems to me, in the foreword and introduction to my book title, The Riddle of Man. One thing that needs to be understood is that the concept of true or false that most people have nowadays should be overcome. As I have repeatedly stressed, also in my preface to title The Riddle of Man, the dualism of right or wrong needs to be enlarged by seeing every view as one aspect of truth, like a photograph from one particular angle. If you photograph a tree first from one side and then from another, the second picture shows the same tree as the first, despite looking different. Today, in our modern and abstract age, when people think in such theoretical terms, despite regarding themselves as pragmatists, a single view of something is thought to be the only true one. People think that they can express the truth in a single idea, and actually this is a form of arrogance. It is arrogant to think, for example, that the Copernican worldview is the only right way to see things, and that before Copernicus, no one says this, but they do think it, people were like children, or even perhaps cattle, since they did not possess this view of the world. This worldview is right and other views were wrong, they think. Yet this is something that has to be overcome. Even the Copernican worldview is only one view, a particular way of looking about the world, of picturing it. There are people who, the moment they notice that spiritual science is putting one view of things, will oppose it with another. In fact, no one who knows there are diverse views of anything will deny this. Nowadays, however, many wish to further their inquiries in a way that can be summed up metaphorically as turning off the light in a room and feeling one's way around it to avoid any single partisan perspective. This, they think, will give a true picture of the room, as opposed to multiple perspectives. In a sense, this is the ideal of modern science, switching the light off and just feeling around in the dark. To counter this, spiritual science has to turn the light on again and acknowledge all the different possible angles on everything. We base our efforts on circulating around things and seeing them from many different angles. That has been our aim for years, and in response some may say that the different angles are contradictory. But it is important for us 
to acknowledge the contradictions, since this is what gives us an all-round view of things, which is precisely what we want. It is not a comfortable position, of course, for people like best to fit their whole view of the world into a small pamphlet, if possible, with as few pages as possible, or make one view the central hub of all their ideas. That, of course, leads to a narrow perspective, whereas our publications are continually expanding to illumine things from different sides and to compile a great many views from which a whole picture of reality can emerge. But at the same time, you will discover that we affront people when the truths we discover through a science of the Spirit increasingly transgress against their dearly held prejudices, and especially, too, when we ignore the demands of certain occultists to keep important matters veiled in secrecy. We find ourselves speaking of things that shock, annoy, or irritate people, partly at least also because many think something has to be one thing or another, either right or wrong. Instead, they ought to see that as humanity evolves, there can never be a single status quo, an absolute truth in relation to any field or discipline. We can never say either that something is utterly wrong. There is no such thing. It is not to provide some final answer that certain views are emerging now, nor should this mean that we look back on previous generations as childlike. Such views are coming to the fore now for a quite different reason. Let us recall here something we all know. In the 15th century, humanity entered the fifth cultural epoch of post-Atlantean development, which we call that of the consciousness soul. In other words, the 15th century saw the beginning of what has emerged particularly in this fifth cultural epoch. Until then, humanity's cultural development had been marked chiefly by the rational or mind soul. But for the consciousness soul to emerge, certain thoughts and modes of thinking assumed a very specific form. The Copernican worldview did not arise because it is completely correct. I have often emphasized that it had to arise, and I will continue to emphasize that in certain respects it is appropriate for our times. It did not emerge because it was the only true way of seeing things, but because it serves the development of the consciousness soul. We best develop the consciousness soul if we gradually allow the Copernican worldview to become intrinsic to our outlook, so that we calculate constellations and planetary movements in the way that happens today. The positive thing about the Copernican worldview is not that it has finally told us the truth, in quotes, to replace the, in quotes, falsehood of former millennia but that it erects a spiritual wall between heaven and earth, between the physical and spiritual world. This sounds terribly paradoxical and will, of course, cause offense to people who have the kinds of prejudice I spoke of earlier. Yet it is true. People began to think of the cosmos in terms of the views of Copernicus because in placing them into this cosmos, the earth's surroundings, it enabled them to erect a spiritual wall through which they could not penetrate. They were shut off from the spirit and were thus able to remain earthbound in their study of the cosmos, thereby developing the consciousness soul. The Copernican worldview was given us so that in erecting a spiritual wall around the earth, we can confine ourselves in an egotistic in as egotistic a way as possible, to earthly things. As the Copernican worldview develops ever more fully, it becomes ever more certain that external investigation of phenomena will sunder us from the world of spirit, and ever more necessary also that we rediscover our connection with the spirit through inner vision by enlivening our inner perception. Strange things go hand in hand. In discussing them, 
what I say inevitably becomes hard to follow. But since there is no other means of understanding them than through anthroposophy, it is anthroposophists who will have to make strenuous efforts to understand them. The philosophical discipline based on Kant is today called epistemology. In fact, this epistemology, or theory of knowledge, is a nail in the coffin of human knowledge. One chief idea that commonly springs to most people's minds when they think of the Kantian theory of knowledge is that the, in quotes, thing outside us is really only an ether vibration, something that has nothing to do with color or tone, but that exists as the motion of the smallest particles in space. Outside us, the air vibrates tonelessly. These resonances of the air enter our ears. Schopenhauer says, somewhat dismissively of the theory of knowledge, that they crash on our ears and then become in us what we call tone. Outside us, everything is mute and only air vibrations exist. Then there are also ether waves outside us that approach our eyes. These waves enter our eyes and an image is created on the retina. But we know nothing about this image unless science studies it. And then these processes, which can only be material in nature, are communicated to the optic nerve and pass on into the visual cortex where a mysterious thing happens. Here the soul succeeds in making what was first dark and mute outside us, luminous and colorful, warm and cold, and so forth, creating things within itself and thus, in quotes, dreaming the whole world. It is very strange, this path, whereby the theory of knowledge seeks to show how the outer world of matter reaches the human mind. But what does this epistemology involve? It is strange that if we stay outside in our surroundings and credit things with possessing tones and colors, which the theory of knowledge regards as the naive realism of the uneducated, we do at least still have a world of tones and colors. But now, in the theory of knowledge, we lead this world toward the eye, E-Y-E, say. And now we have an image on the retina, followed by its reproduction, in processes affecting the optic nerve. In our brain, nothing of the outer world exists, but our inner life magically conjures the whole world out of vibrations. It reminds one of Baron Munchausen, who pulls himself up by his own hair. First of all, we get rid of everything that constitutes the world, and then we have nothing but brain vibrations. And then the soul creates a whole outer world for itself again that we have previously got rid of. Like Munchausen, we take hold of our own hair and raise ourselves upward. Yet this is the philosophical worldview of our day, and anyone who objects to it is out of step with modern knowledge. It is odd, in trying to trace how the whole manifold world enters us, we are left ultimately only with processes in the cerebrum, which in fact are of the simplest kind, less complex than processes in the optic nerve. If we study how the world exists within us, we arrive at something extremely simple. We seek the mind or spirit, but arrive only at a spirit that dreams the world into being. Here we have to make a leap of imagination since no one has yet succeeded in isolating or distilling the mind. In our quest for the human mind, we first arrive at brain vibrations, and then we are compelled to recreate all that is no longer there. This is the path pursued by science in order to trace how the outer world reaches our mind. On earth we find a multiplicity of conditions and living influences, a great cornucopia that can amaze us. If we study how different people are in different regions, quite irrespective of whether we feel more drawn to some and less to others, which is irrelevant here, and consider the great scope of human differentiation, it is really as manifold as the phenomena of the sensory world itself. 
in olden times when people are thought to have been childlike or even animal-like, they try to understand this great multiplicity by ascending from sensory things to a spiritual realm, something they no longer do. As one ascends ever further from the wealth of phenomena on the earth, it seems very much like passing from the external sensory world and passing through the eye, E-Y-E, and brain to reach the human mind. We arrive at the picture Copernicanism derives from the great spiritual cosmos. Just as physiological epistemology has resorted to a method in which brain vibrations form a barrier that prevents the outer world reaching the human soul, so in the same way Copernicanism erects a great obstacle to a world of spirit. If one wishes to test the worth of a worldview, one has to know the point of view that has given rise to it. The perspective of Copernicanism does not replace falsehood with truth, but seeks to erect planks and barriers so that humankind can develop the consciousness soul inside this earthly shelter. That is the thing that really counts here. One needs to appraise things with a keen and sober eye. We must first be able to shake the foundations upon which others like to stand so comfortably today with their worldviews. Without shaking these foundations, we will fail to see that Copernicanism erects barriers to spiritual vision and will therefore fail to find any relationship with spiritual science. You see, this science of the spirit has certain requirements. It is worth moving away from an earthly standpoint for a moment and imagining what a merely Copernican worldview means to the cosmos itself. Nothing but a mental calculation. Spiritual science, by contrast, needs more than mental calculations. It needs something that opens itself to spiritual perception. Why do we have a field of geology that subscribes to the idea that the earth evolved solely from a purely mineral world? Because the Copernican worldview inevitably led to this, to modern materialistic geology. It contains nothing that could show us how, looking in from the cosmos, as it were, in a spiritual perspective, the earth can be seen as an ensouled, spirit-imbued being. The universe, conceived on Copernican lines, can only give rise to a dead earth. A living, ensouled, and spirit-filled earth has to be conceived from the perspective of a different cosmos altogether really from a quite different cosmos. Looking back toward Earth from the cosmos, we can, of course, only ever describe certain traits or features of the life of this Earth being. In this perspective, no, excuse me, is this perspective an entirely imaginary one? Is it fantasy to think of the Earth from the perspective of the cosmos? No, it is very real. It occurred to Hermann Grimm, though having written about it he immediately excused himself with the caveat that this idea was not an article of faith but, quote, merely fantasy, close quote. In an essay in 1858, he wrote that the human soul, liberated from the body, might freely encircle the earth and could then look down upon earth to see everything that happens there in a quite different way. He would see things from a quite different perspective, says Hermann Grimm. For instance, looking into human hearts as, quote, into a glass beehive, close quote. The thoughts arising in human hearts would emerge as if from a glass beehive, a beautiful image. And then, said Grimm, one could imagine that after floating around the earth for some time and looking down on it from without, the soul would reincarnate upon earth, would have a father and mother, a country, and all that exists on earth, and would have to forget all that it had experienced from the cosmic perspective. And if the soul became an historian in the modern sense, Hermann Grimm is talking subjectively, he would inevitably have to forget all he had known before, since one cannot write history with that different perspective. This picture comes very close to the truth. 
It is true that the human soul floats around the earth, in a sense, between death and a new birth, and looks down upon earth, but in a way determined by karmic connections, as I have often described. The soul certainly has the feeling, then, that this earth is an ensouled and spirit-filled organism, and the prejudice disappears that it is only a geological structure without soul. In after-death vision, we see the earth in a highly differentiated way, so that, for instance, the Orient appears different in nature from the American Occident. You cannot speak to the dead about the earth in the same way as geologists speak, for they fail to understand geological ideas. When they look down from cosmic space upon the Orient, extending from Asia a long way into Russia, the earth in that region appears to them to shimmer with a blue color, a bluish purple. The Western Hemisphere, on the other hand, tinged with a more American nuance, appears to them to be a fiery red. That is the polarity they see when they look down on earth from the cosmos. Naturally, this does not figure in the Copernican worldview. It is a different kind of perception from a different perspective. If we look from this perspective, we realize that the eastern hemisphere of the ensouled earth organism appears different from the western hemisphere. A blue shimmer in the east and in the west a blazing up from within and therefore a fiery red appearance. And here you have one example of how between death and rebirth we can orient ourselves to what we then learn to perceive we learn to perceive the configuration of the earth, its different appearance at different places, in terms of the cosmos and of a spiritual perspective, a purplish blue in one hemisphere and a fiery red in the other, and developing, excuse me, and depending on the spiritual need that we elaborate from our karma, this will have a determining influence on the place where we wish to incarnate again. I am simplifying, of course, and things are far more complex in reality. But this does give you a sense of the conditions after death from which a person develops powers that subsequently lead him to incarnate again in a specific corporeality on earth. I have only described two colors to which destiny is oriented, but there are, of course, others, many more. I will just mention in passing that in the more central region between west and east the earth appears a greener color seen from without, green in the regions where we live, for instance. Here there is already a threefold quality, therefore, and this can give us important insight into the ways in which what we perceive between death and rebirth can become an orientation for us in relation to our decision to be born again in a particular region of the earth. If we give due attention to such matters, we can gradually come to see that certain things never usually considered are at work in the interplay between people embodied here on earth and disembodied souls. When we go abroad and wish to understand people in another country, we have to learn their language. And if we wish to communicate with the dead, we also have to gradually learn their language, which is at the same time the language of spiritual science. It is a language spoken, in fact, by all the so-called living and the so-called dead, a bridge spanning from there to here and here to there. It is especially important, when learning this language, to go beyond abstract ideas and form living pictures of the cosmos, such an image is that of the globe floating in the cosmos, bluish purple in one area, fiery red and yellow in another, and a green girdle between them. Pictorial ideas gradually bear us into the world of spirit, and this is the important thing. If we are to speak seriously about a world of spirit, we naturally have to form these pictorial ideas, and furthermore, not think they are mere figments of the imagination but that they have a reality which can lead us further. So let us conjure this image once again, the eastern hemisphere shimmering blue and purple, 
in the fiery reddish-yellow western hemisphere, and then much differentiation within this. When a soul looks down between death and rebirth in our current cycle of time, he can perceive amidst the purplish-blue shimmer a golden form, a golden crystalline form where Palestine lies, an enlivened place seen from the perspective of spirit, and this is Jerusalem. In the imaginations of the Apocalypse, this is also referred to as the heavenly Jerusalem. These things are not invented, but can be perceived. Seen by the Spirit, the mystery of Golgotha resembles the wonders a modern astronomer may see through his telescope when he sees the sudden flaming of a star. From a spiritual perspective, seen from the cosmos, the event of Golgotha was the flaming up of a golden star in the blue earth aura of the eastern half of the globe. Here you have a vivid picture to accompany what I described at the end of the lecture the day before yesterday. It is very important that we form such vivid pictures of the cosmos so that the human soul can once again find its way feelingly into the spirit of this cosmos. Trying to accompany the soul of a dead person with this imagination of the gold-shimmering crystalline form of the heavenly Jerusalem within the blue-purple earth aura can bring you closer to him, for this belongs to the imaginations into which we pass at death, ex Deo nascemur, in Christo morimur. We can either shut ourselves off from spiritual reality or try to approach closer to it. We shut ourselves off from it when we try to calculate reality numerically. While mathematics is still spirit, pure spirit even, when applied to physical reality, it becomes a means to close ourselves off from the spirit. The more you measure and calculate, the more you isolate yourself from the spirit. Kant once said, the degree of knowledge in the world is exactly equal to the amount of mathematics in it. But from a different perspective, it would be just as correct to say, quote, the darkness in the world is equal to the degree to which people have measured it in their calculations. Close quote. We come closer to the life of spirit to the extent that we move on increasingly from external perceptions, especially from abstract ideas, to imaginations, to pictures. Copernicus let us all into ways of calculating the universe. The opposite mode of vision must lead us to imagine the world again, to picture it vividly, to conceive a universe with which the human soul can identify, so that the earth appears within it as a shining sphere, bluish-purple in one hemisphere, with a gold-shimmering heavenly Jerusalem and a fiery yellowish-red in the other. Where does the shimmering bluish purple in the earth aura originate? In looking from without upon this aspect of the globe, its physical nature recedes. The light aura becomes more transparent and the earth's darkness vanishes. This creates the blue color that shines through, a phenomenon that can be explained in terms of Goethe's theory of colors. But in the western hemisphere, the inner nature of the earth flames up and confirms what I described in my last lecture. In America, people are strongly influenced by what comes from below the earth, what is subterranean. And this is why the sparks of a reddish-yellow fire gleam and shine from within the earth and out into the cosmos, shimmering red and yellow. This picture gives only a faint idea of the reality but it can show you the possibility of going beyond merely general abstract ideas about the world we live in, between death and rebirth, to form very tangible pictures. All such imaginations prepare us to form a stronger connection with worlds of spirit, with the higher hierarchies, with the world in which we live between death and a new birth. Tomorrow I would like to speak a good deal more about this, 
but today I will just mention one thing in particular. Our current stage of human evolution, the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, which is to serve the development of the consciousness soul, contains many secrets. One of these is especially well concealed by those who think such truths should not be passed on to modern humanity. This is a difficult subject, but since there is no one else anywhere in the world who will give ear to such things, you will have to heed what I am going to say. During our present era, starting with the 15th century, a remarkable longing started to surface in human beings. Living initially in the subconscious, it must increasingly be called up into the conscious mind. It is a longing that originates in something very specific. As I have often said, the human being is a dual being and also a being with diverse aspects in other ways, but a dual being in the sense of a division between the head and the rest of the organism. The head, as I have said, is the aspect of us to which Darwin's theory can be applied especially, since we can trace it back to animal forms. During old moon evolution, the human being had animal forms, not those of animals living today, but a more spiritual, more etheric animal form, which then hardened into the human head. And today, when animals are evolving on the earth into the forms we are familiar with, the human being no longer evolves under the same conditions that once influenced his head development which he now simply inherits, but under conditions affecting the rest of his organism. But this does not derive from the animals. Our head originates with the animals, albeit only from etheric animals. In our head, therefore, we bear animality, but of an etheric kind. During the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, this dawned on the human subconscious, Increasingly, people sensed that there was something of the animal in them, but they were no longer able to picture this spiritually. The idea took root in their heads that man must inevitably feel animal-like, and this culminated in Darwin's theory of humanity's descent from the animals. However, this did not just come to expression in Darwin's theory of evolution. Animals perceive things differently from people, having a more intimate connection with the world than we do. The outstanding quality of human beings on earth is due to their capacity to detach themselves from their surroundings, which then necessitates them building a bridge back to all they have sundered themselves from. The animal experiences the outer world within itself far more than we do. If animals were philosophers, They would not speak of the limits of experience, since there are none for them, in the sense in which people speak of them. These limits come about only through the human being's higher organization. By virtue of the animal group soul, animals sense the whole universe within them and have no awareness of limits to their knowledge. From the 15th century, people increasingly felt that they bore an animal within them, but they could not picture this spiritually, supersensibly, etherically. Instead, regarding themselves as physically related to the animals. Subconsciously, they desired the same form of knowledge that the animal possesses, but inevitably this was not possible. The animal lives with the thing in itself, whereas this is out of reach for the human being the moment he desires to be an animal, to possess the world as an animal does, but knows this cannot be. Perceiving a thing in itself that is unattainable for us arose from the human longing to feel like an animal, yet the recognition at the same time that we cannot. This is the secret of Kantianism, It is intimately connected with modern humanity's developing awareness of animal nature and of human limits to knowledge. In olden times, people knew that there are no limits to the knowledge of an animal, and therefore, for instance, 
they felt that understanding the language of the animals was a very fortunate gift, as one finds in many old legends. That was one thing they knew, the people of olden times, that the animal has no limits to knowledge, in the sense we are aware of as modern human beings. They knew something else as well, that the beings who belong to the hierarchy of the Angeloi are free, are beings of free will. And they knew that we human beings are in the process of becoming angels. When our current stage of earth evolution is over and is succeeded by Jupiter evolution, the human being will stand at the level of the angels. He is on the way to becoming free. Freedom is developing within him. Yet what will happen in forthcoming times as the consciousness soul gradually develops if humanity rejects this evolution toward angelic nature? Humanity will be left only with the thought that freedom is an illusion. Human actions will be seen as subject to natural imperatives. Wherever boundaries to knowledge are erected, the development toward freedom is rejected. And this is very closely connected with all that has so far emerged in rough and ready fashion from the idea that we have evolved from animals. In fact, our origins are far more complex, as I have tried to show. Some of the things I have said today were rather difficult to take in, but this was necessary. And tomorrow it will enable us to speak from a particular angle about the connection between modern life on earth in the physical body and life between death and rebirth. Those concepts will be somewhat easier. You have been good enough to attend to me as we spoke of more difficult ideas, and tomorrow this will help us in relation to other ones. That is the end of Lecture 9, which is the second lecture in the seven-lecture cycle, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, which is in the book Dying Earth and Living Cosmos, Collected Works, Volume 181.